I'll say hello properly and welcome and thank you so much for joining me today. I appreciate your time and um, yeah, so it'd be great to get to know you both. Um, you're both from Australia and you both have lipedema. And being from England, I was explaining to Shelley that I don't really know much about the Australian way of dealing with lipedema. So I'll, um, yeah, I'll just let you guys chat because it's your video. I don't want to take over too much. <laughs> hey, thank you. And thank you so much for having us, Amy. Um, so I was diagnosed in November 2022, so almost a year ago. Actually, yes, a year ago. Yeah. And it was two weeks before that that I'd heard the word lipedema. Never heard it in my life. And I was listening to a podcast and it wasn't a medical podcast. It was just a lady talking about her life and what she was going through. And it sounded like my story. I was like, oh, my goodness, this is me. And I was on my way to work. So as soon as I got to work, I'm like Googling what is lipedema. And, um, yeah, and then two weeks later I was diagnosed. So... I'm very lucky, like where I live, we have a lipedema clinic. And so I was able to um, meet with the doctor. He does a group Zoom. So this group Zoom call explaining lipedema to everybody. Then I sent in all of my photos and a bit of a history on myself. And that's how I got my diagnosis. Like it was just this mad two weeks of finding out this thing and then knowing, yes, this that is me it was crazy that's amazing crazy. it was very similar for me i heard it on uh radio to a bbc radio too i used to listen to like a talk show and someone rang up and just said um she's a nurse and she uh, knows people with lipedema and i was like exactly the same I was like everything she said i was like yep yeah, yep yeah, yep yeah, yep yeah. and then you go online and you're like yes yes and then you, it's just amazing how many people say there's literally a, a, a switch where you think that's it and it just shows how many of us have like this a lot of symptoms but the same symptoms and why has it not been picked up as a real medical thing right <laughs> yeah that's right we all have this we all present slightly differently but we have that common thread yeah. of you know certain things are like oh yeah that's me that's me and yeah yeah it's amazing that i hadn't heard of it before like and the Di average age of diagnosis is 48 and I was 48 wow. so I'm like yeah there you go bang on <laughs> oh that's great and what about you Tiana yeah so I actually found out about lipedema through um the doom scroll on Instagram reels at like you know nine o'clock at night and I'm usually pretty early to bed and so I was like come on Tiana get off Instagram like it's time to go to bed <laughs> Um, and I came across the Lipedema Mamas um, uh, Instagram and she, she had a reel that sort of listed some of the symptoms of uh, Lipedema and I sort of thought, oh, that sounds like my legs. And so I ended up pressing on her profile and reading up a little bit more and I was utterly convinced straight away that I had it. Um, but after some investigation into lipedema, it, the sort of common um, comment was that there was nothing you can do about it. So I didn't, so this was in, again, like Shell, in November last year um, that I found out about it, but I sort of didn't do anything with that information because the, the message that I was getting was, so what, there's nothing you can do about it unless you want to spend you know, tens of thousand dollars on surgery. Um, but then I was having some annual leave from work around uh, January this year and I thought since I'm on leave, why don't I make the effort to go and um, get a diagnosis? And uh, I'm from, I'm closer to Brisbane um, and the Gold Coast is probably about an hour away for me. And so I'm very lucky to be relatively close to, as Shell said, um, a specialist clinic um, at the Gold Coast. And I went through their diagnosis pathway, which was putting all your information into a database, including photos, going through their Q&A, Zoom call, and then getting a tele 
a telehealth appointment with one of the specialists and getting your diagnosis over the phone. Um, so I was diagnosed with stage two lipedema um, and my lipedema. We're, we're talking about whether it's lipedema know, or lipedema. I know, I know, because I say lipedema and then I know so, like some Australians say lipedema, some Welsh people say lipedema. And it's hard because you say liposuction, not liposuction. Although maybe some people say liposuction, but yeah, I don't know. I don't know what the correct, <laughs> I just say what I say. <laughs> oh, well, just digressing from my story a little yeah. bit, um, we had um, one of the sur- Australian surgeons come on our, our podcast recently. We haven't aired the episode yet and we were calling it lipedema. So we've been training ourselves to say lipedema ever since we started the podcast. And in some of our earlier episodes, you can hear us going lipa up uh, lipedema. <laughs> and then he said, well, actually, it came out of Germany that we should be um, saying lipedema. And so um, we sort of have to retrain ourselves to say it the other way now, yeah. which is hilarious. Yeah, well, we're, we're all inclusive. You can say it how you like. Yeah, yeah. why not? Yeah, although I know that due to a new paper, I, I forget things easily, but they are trying to rename it to something completely different. So it's not lipedema anymore. It'd be, it's like, I've not Googled it. I know in Wales, um, it's all changing um, and they're not offering compression anymore because they're saying, because there's no edema in lipedema, you don't need compression. And this, yeah, wow. it's crazy. Wow. Wonder what Fascinating called. because honestly, compression has been such a game changer for my condition. So I, I can't imagine. I know. Not. And it's like fine if you don't have edema, which it's just it's for the scientists to decide for me. <laughs> but it doesn't just help that. It helps your circulation. It stops progression. It stops it like expanding and progress. There's so many other reasons and like lymphatic drainage is good for draining fluid when you can't have the massages so well, I mean that's yeah that was the edema part but yeah it's not just for that and I think it's just a way of stopping any support and any help yeah but, yeah okay it's an excuse that they're using yeah I don't um, know it's just it seems like some areas of the world are moving forward and then some areas are going backwards and it's just not fair like it's not fair on people and it's no, a lot the about the funding. Yeah, it's a, there's a lot about the funding. Yeah. So um, I guess uh, in Australia we have a, a compression garment scheme, but it's specifically for those that are on NDIS, which is like then, um, you know, then I, I believe, Shell, uh, correct National me if I'm wrong, Shell. National Disability Insurance Scheme, yeah. That's right. So they're disabled and receiving the scheme and so therefore they are eligible to receive garments. Um, there is also a scheme with Queensland Health, which I've, because I, I work um, for government health, um, I was talking to somebody um, in Allied Health the other day and I was like, how does this work? Like, what do you guys do? And there's actually um, the Department of Health have told the hospitals that they must provide garments to eligible people uh, like lymphedema, um, uh, venous insufficiency and stuff if they come through the public health system but they didn't give them any funding okay. to make that happen so it's coming out of their own bucket of money which they don't get growth funds for so then unable to provide a service if they don't have the funding to back that service yeah uh, so it's kind of this mismatch between what what they want to do for patient care and what they can do in terms of money yeah the australian health system do you work in like a do you have a public health and then like insurance or are you yeah how does it work because in england we just have national health care or private health care yeah we're the same so we have a um, public health our medicare system and then we have private health that we can buy into as well but I don't think really anything helps with lipedema. Well, no, no. No, unless you have that lymphedema portion, uh, you only get a very small amount back, and that's if you have private health. So our 
public health system is, well, our tax system is set up to disincentivize people to not have public health, uh, private health, sorry. So we actually pay premiums for private health, like I'm sure you do. Um, but if we do not opt into private health, we actually get taxed um, more uh, oh. at tax time. So we're disincentivized not to have public uh, private health sorry um, but what you do get back from private health is very minimal so for example um, I have top extras cover and top hospital cover and I'm lucky slash unlucky to also have a lymphedema portion of my life lipedema diagnosis therefore um, I can get part subsidy for manual lymphatic drainage so a uh, normal manual lymphatic drainage session is approximately $100 and I would get approximately $65 off that service okay. until I reach the threshold. Now, because I've been through two surgeries and I've had to have um, MLD twice a week, you know, for however long, um, I've reached that threshold and now I'm paying full price until the next financial year. Right. Okay. So you only get a bucket of money towards that as well as compression garments. Um, so compression garments falls under medical equipment uh, with my, my private health and I think with a lot of others and you get $300 a year um, bucket of money that you can opt to get reimbursed for things like compression garments. Now, interestingly, I tried to get reimbursed for my lymph press, which I recently bought, and I have just received a letter today saying that they've denied that claim because it's not part of my extras cover. So I need to, I presume I'm going to need to go to the doctor and get a script for that lymph press and then try and redo my claim. Okay. So they will try anything to get out of paying us money yes yeah, yeah no and it's such a shame that you have to it, it's such a shame that lymphedema is recognized and that you it gets something like I know it's not a, a lot but then lipedema is just like nah and it's it's just such a shame that people have to uh, yeah it's like they're picking and choosing what's a valuable illness and condition over the other and yeah it's not our fault well, that I have they're a feeling, lacking in knowledge <laughs> no well I have a feeling that the lymphedema portion comes from all of the cancer research because a lot of you know when you go through and you get cancer removed and if it's around the lymph nodes and you get that removed you end up having lymphedema from that so I reckon that's where it's been acknowledged now because of all of the efforts and research into cancer and then everything that happens post-cancer treatment. Uh, so that kind of makes sense. We need the same kind of um, media incentives to, you know, have research into lipedema. Yeah, no, it's true. Yeah, it's, yeah, it's definitely like more related to cancer. But um, yeah, I spoke to a lady in Germany and their um, system is very like, good for the lymph lymphedema but like lacking in lipedema um and it's just a shame that conditions are just like put on different pedestals and <laughs> treated differently and it shouldn't be because they both can become debilitating and I mean I've not got experience with lymph lymphedema so I can't speak on that but um yeah and it's it's just sad that we're just left left to deal with it it's like um I was going to ask about the mental health support that you get in Australia as well, because in England we do have um, free access to some short term um, talking therapies. But I know a lot of people have to spend money on on that side of it, especially with like self-esteem and stuff. So I just wondered if there's any access in Australia or... Yeah, we can go to our um, our GP and Tiana, if you want to add in, um, and we can get um, so many visits a year to um, professional help, like with diet or with mental health or physio that you can, yeah, so once a year, I think it's four or five visits, but, but that, and that's subsidised. That's all you can get. Yeah. Right. So it's not a lot of free help. No. 
No, that's right. Um, so I believe it's five sessions, but you can um, then, like the psychologist can then opt you to get another five. Um, but you actually have to pay outright and then you get reimbursed. So if you're if you don't have a couple of hundred dollars in your bank account, and many people do not, that's not an option for them because you actually have to pay them and then get reimbursed after the fact, and that's that's not always accessible. Yeah, no, so. I think that's very similar here, um, mm. and it's it's something that I'm like really passionate about. I have a lot of mental health issues, probably a lot stemming from lip, having lipedema and not knowing about it, and I feel like a lot of um, yeah, every, everything seems to stem back to mental health. Like anybody I speak to who has lipedema, they seem to have some aspect that they struggle with. Obviously, a lot, it's the body image and self-esteem issues. But, I mean, yeah, we could do a completely separate episode on the mental health aspect. And that seems to me, like, yeah, the physical side is important. But that side, that affects your daily life. That affects you a minute, every minute of every day. And... It's just it's just a shame that we haven't got that support. I think, I don't know, I think maybe if a lot of people had to choose between compression garments and therapy, I think a lot of people would choose therapy yeah. just because it has so much of an impact because it impacts your family, it impacts your friends, it impacts every aspect of your life. And yeah, it's, um, yeah, I hope in the future that'll become like standard for people with any condition, but obviously we're talking about lipedema. But yeah, at least I suppose at least you get five sessions. But like you say, if you can't afford that extra to be reimbursed, then you kind of just left hanging. And once you've opened up a box, you kind of need to close it. And <laughs> I don't think you yeah, can do that yeah. in five sessions. But um, yeah, yeah um, I guess um, from my sort of mental health journey, I've always sort of sought uh, help in like in the therapy respect when I've felt like I've needed to, I'm like, oh, I need to check in with someone professional because something's happening in my life that's impacting my mental health and I just need that check-in. So for me, maybe five sessions will be sufficient because it's like I'm getting to that point where I'm like, oh, something's not quite right here. Uh, I need to just like do a check-in and see where we're up to and like get those tools back because you sort of learn the tools when you go to therapy and you use the tools, but then something new pops up and and you f either forget those tools or you're out of practice or they don't actually support what you're going through next. So in my opinion, mental health services should be under Medicare, exactly like GP services, and we should be getting those services, like especially now after covid I feel like the whole world has changed and I don't know anybody who's not going through something drastically horrendous over the past two years that would probably do nicely with some, you know, professional support. Um, really interesting to learn about that side of the Australian healthcare. Um, I thought it'd be very interesting to talk a bit about your podcast. Um, so I've listened, I'm, I'm going to be honest, I'm not listening to all of the episodes um, but I've listened to a lot of them. <laughs> um, Thank you. It's, it's great. I think I, what I found really interesting is that you were like, there needs to be an Australian perspective because when you look online or in Facebook groups, it's England, Europe, America and Canada sometimes. Mm -hmm. And you don't see a lot of Australians. I mean, when you see a, an Australian pop up, you're like, oh, there's an Australian group. And it's like a bit of a, not a novelty, but yeah, you know what I mean? <laughs> and yeah, I think there's a lot of, at countries that need to be represented um because as we were saying before you joined the call like it's so expensive in certain countries that you have to travel and it's that kind of knowledge people need and yeah we just all need to connect and know what people are doing in australia to deal with lipedema sorry I don't that's know right the and the more yeah. stories the more stories we can share and the more perspectives we can share, like globally, like, you know, we just had a global world, like a world congress. Like, yes, like people are standing up, people are coming together, like all those passionate people in one spot. Like, that's got to be good, right? That's got to be good for us getting the recognition, getting the funding and breaking the stigma. Like, and yeah, 
that's what that's what we wanted to do. Like that's why we started the podcast. It was like we'd both listened to, like I'd listened to a podcast and found out Tiana was a podcaster, is listening to podcasts, and we're like, well, this is a platform that needs to be explored for us. Like there isn't something in Australia, so yeah, that's where we decided. Hey, it's going to be us. That's great. And you both got <laughs> definitely got the personalities for podcasting. So that's it makes it easier oh. to listen and interesting. And I think because there's two of you, it's nice to hear the conversation. And yeah, it's it's fun. It's nice to listen to. Now, yeah, Shell's being no coy. <laughs> Shell's being coy because this was her idea. The podcast was Shell's idea. And all of a sudden I got an Instagram message from Shell and I'd been following her since I um, created my own Instagram dedicated page. Um, and we just, I think we just sort of vibed with each other's content and just like Shell's personality came through. So I was always commenting on, and, you know, reacting back to all of her posts. And one day she messaged me and she said, I want to start a podcast for Lipedema. Uh, would you like to be my co-host? And I was like, <laughs> Me? <laughs> like, me? Okay. Um, and I just thought it was such a great idea, but I just couldn't imagine pulling it off. And then all of a sudden we had a full roster of guests and Shell just made it happen. And I thought, this lady is amazing. <laughs> like, oh, my gosh, I got to get on board. I got to lift my game and do, like, do some stuff. So, yeah, yeah it was true. all Shell's idea. Oh, oh thank you. I'm very impulsive and I'm like a dog with a bone when <laughs> when I have an idea, good or bad. <laughs> I sort of and so Tiana's beautiful because she just she can just calm me down a bit sometimes to just <laughs> which is what I need. Yeah, well, Shell comes up with all these ideas, and I was like, mm, "That's great." Or we could just concentrate on what we're doing now, and then like get that down pat, and then we can work on the next thing. But it's so good because we balance each other out, and that's so necessary because this wouldn't have happened without Shell. Um, and then, like, I, I find that I can like be that rational, like, "Here's the ceiling of what we can cope with right now sustainably," and so we can work together like that. But a lot of opportunities have happened for us because, like, she, she had the courage and then actually executed the whole plan, like, in, like that. Yeah, no, that's amazing because <laughs> we all have ideas and then the next day we're like, yeah, I don't think so. <laughs> yeah. So it's great yeah. that or you've I done can it. go to sleep. Yeah, yeah. And I probably would have chickened out if it wasn't for Tiana as well. Like, so having, like, that person to – to be my person that she is now and you know I don't think I think I would have like gone oh you know imposter syndrome I can't do that but I think as a team and seeing how we were when we were just chatting it was like yeah this this is going to work this is going to be amazing so yeah and it definitely yeah. does work <laughs> from a listener point of view it's great ah, um, thank you so obviously you've done a few episodes but I was interested in finding out if you've got any goals with the podcast or any things that you want to achieve more than what you already have? Um, so, yeah, like what's the future of the Lipedema podcast? So um, if I speak from my perspective first, Shell, I feel like the, the most important thing for me is to make this a movement in Australia um, and to give those people that support Lipedema in Australia a platform to be able to say, hey, these are my services, here's where you can find me, so that our listeners who are struggling with this know that there's people that can support them in their own backyard. So, like, Australia is a big country, but compared to some of the other countries that are doing really great things, it's relatively small. And, you know, if you have someone in Sydney that doesn't know that there is support in Sydney, we would like to be that platform for them to know that. And there's Lipedema Australia doing amazing things and they've got websites and resources. And if you're not a reader, if you're an audible learner, then, hey, we're here for you. Um, but if you if you learn by research and reading and stuff, like maybe go to Lipedema Australia and their website and they've got tons of stuff and they do amazing work. Yeah, um, yeah. On top of that, like I just want to reach women like I just want to get in front of women I just want to tell them they're not alone like they're like we only found out a year ago 
how many other women are still out there not knowing? Like if we hadn't stumbled across it, we would still be going, oh, well, you know, because I thought I was deformed. Like I would have still been living my life thinking I'm deformed, there's nothing I can do about it. So I want to take the podcast, like we've already nearly scheduled our whole second season, which we're not even starting to record until January. Like I've <laughs> almost scheduled it out. And then I'd like us to be able to go to events and where women, wherever women are, I want to be there. Mm. I want to be there. I want to get those mums who are exhausted and, and think they don't fit in. And I want to, and you know, just break down those beauty standards. And even if you don't have lipedema, you're bloody awesome. You know, you can do anything. And let's just, yeah, I just want to lift everyone up, really. No, and it definitely comes across from both of you. Um and it, yeah, I think like I don't know if this you feel the same, but like the Instagram aspect of it is great, but it feels very saturated, and which is good. I'm not complaining, but it's like then yeah. we need to keep moving, and we need to either go to like yeah, so like go into a new place where people will see it, and it's just constantly thinking of new ways to reach people, um, mm-hmm. and it's great that that's like your goal because. Yeah, you're going to do great at it. <laughs> you already are. Thank but you. yeah, it's that Thank drive you. that you need. Well, well that's it. We've, we've got the lipedema community behind us yeah. and starting to support us. So now it's like, okay, where are the women who are suffering in silence who don't even know that there are things you can put in place that are cost effective and efficient, just caring for yourself and loving yourself? Like, we need to find them. Like, yeah. Yeah. that's our next mission. Yeah, them. and as much as um, like I so enjoy our recording sessions, and it's so interesting to talk to the experts. But I actually my favorite part is talking to women with lipedema and hearing their story. And I feel like if it's cathartic for me to talk about my journey with lipedema, it must be cathartic for them to have a platform to talk about their journey with lipedema and to allow that for someone and do that on scale is like it's so rewarding for us yeah no I I definitely have that as well with my channel where experts are great I'm never gonna say that but I think it's more interesting to learn from others and because we're the ones living it and there's so many like similarities and yeah like I just believe in community and it's great that you have those people as well those people lipedema patients <laughs> it also helps Absolutely. that we really like talking because like <laughs> you know we have our own instagram pages but you don't get to like rattle off a whole bunch of thoughts like there's no word vomit on instagram you have to have a short sharp reel and to be honest i'm still learning how to do that well um but you know give me a platform where i can talk and mate, give me three hours like um, you'll never shut me up <laughs> Especially on a topic we're so passionate about, like education, advocacy, like that's that's where we are. And the healing that happens for us listening to more yeah. stories. Like I think every conversation I have, I'm just more inspired and, yeah, it, it, it's a privilege. We are privileged to be sharing these stories. Like So, yeah, we're the same. Our warrior interviews are our favourite. Yeah, I think inspired is a great word. Every time I do a video call with someone after I'm like, right, what am I going to do? And it it is, it's because it reminds you who you're doing it for. And I mean, obviously we're doing it for ourselves or our past selves, but it's for the people that don't know. And yeah, and I suppose a lot lot of the aspect with lipedema is that we've never felt heard. And we've always felt probably the opposite, that we're being told that we're not, that we're wrong or our concerns aren't a problem, we're just overweight or this and that. So when people actually sit and listen to you, um, it's just, yeah, it's amazing what listening can do for people. Mm. Feeling well, good. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. And um, look, we, you know, from my point of view, because I'm an earlier stage and I probably look earlier stage, well, now I do because I've had surgery, but even before I had surgery, I sort of, I was making comments to Shell that I was getting comments that, you know, I didn't look like I had lipedema. Um, And so I was advocating for the people in the earlier stages, but I feel like we've come to the point where we need to advocate for those in the later stages. And we haven't had 
the privilege of having a guest on that's stage four on MDIS or anything. And, and I think that those are really important messages because it, it helps to, to teach us lessons to how to avoid um, the medical system working against us yeah. and gaslighting us and failing, and, yeah. and failing us. Yeah. And um, if those women could, you know, have the courage to come on and talk about their journeys, and I'm sure they will, I'm sure we'll find some next year, um, I'd really like to highlight their journeys as well because I can talk about earlier stages, um, but, but like, they're the people that have been missed and failed. Yeah. I think there's a bit of a, or there has been a bit of a divide between the lipedema community between earlier stage and late stage. And it's, it seems to be the later stage is saying, oh, I wish I looked like you, don't complain. Whereas the earlier stages are saying, like, I still have the same issues. Like uh, the Congress, I was there and they said, they did a, a, a research paper that showed that I don't know how to say it, but the length, uh, the progression of stage doesn't relate to the symptom severity. So you can still be stage one and have the severe pain, like the reactions to cell, like to getting cellulitis, whereas later stages might not experience the same. So to invalidate different stages for those reasons, it's just creating a battle that we don't need between the community. <laughs> I mean, if you've got... And I the... just think they're hurt, though. I just think they're hurt. It is, it is, yeah. I think yeah. people, especially the later stages, and I might have been at like that at one point where you think, well, I, I, because I, I mean, I'm big still, but I was even bigger. And you think, well, your, your body looks nice and it is kicking out at the wrong people because it's not the community that's failed them, it's uh, medical people. And it's just a shame, but... Yeah, no, I liked it when you um, mentioned, I think it was Shelley in one of your videos that the average age is like 48 and you want it to be there. And that's the goal, isn't it? Like the sooner the better. <laughs> Absolutely. Imagine like if, if I'd found out at 28 how I would have done things differently. You know, I would have known how to care for my lymphatic system. I didn't even know what a lymphatic system was until a year ago. I knew that, oh, if you got cancer and it was in your lymph nodes, that was bad. And that was the extent of my education on lymph in the lymphatic system. So if I'd known about the lymphatic system in my 20s, I would have started dry brushing then. I would, you know, I would have started all the things to help my body fight this. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I'm wondering whether, because I come from a dancing background and so, like, I was always wearing, like, stockings and, you know, when I started the professional dancing, it was like the fishnet stockings and I wonder, I just wonder whether that um, progression in my legs didn't show up until later on because every single day, most of the day, I was wearing fishnet stockings okay. and they're not compressive but they're, constantly moving and rubbing against your skin so surely with the movement that I was doing it was like moving stuff around um in a lymphatic massage while we in yeah, your fish yeah yeah right. when I was doing mm -hmm. can -can, fab yeah yeah awesome. if you've got anything else to add anything you want to say I, I will be sharing your information I'll put it on the screen either before before and at the end of the video and in the description but um yeah, just I'll let you guys summarise or just say what you want to say. <laughs> Can I hit Amy with our favourite question, Tiana? I oh, love oh. that. So, Amy, if you could go back and give your younger self one piece of advice, what would you say to her? Oh, um, what would I say? I would say don't try and be like everybody else because... I had three siblings that were all small and they've never presented lipedema. So I was always compared to them from a very young age through like no fault of my parents. It's just kind of what happened. And then when you go to school, I was always the big one and I always wanted to be like everybody else. And then even with my personality, I always feel, felt like I had to be louder or funny or silly or all these things. And yeah, I just wasted so much time trying to be somebody else and 
everybody I mean this is, applies to everybody but you can't be anybody else other than yourself <laughs> and yeah I think that'd be it yeah that is awesome embrace all that you are yeah and don't compare yourself to anyone else yeah I love that yeah especially as a ch that. child because up until a point you are yourself kids are just amazing and then you get to that mm. age and you're so self-aware and it's it's just it's just sad that people can't just be like that child again just being crazy and <laughs> doing their own thing and yeah I think I'd, I've spent a lot of my life trying to change my physical body but also how I behave and how I am in front of people like, I'm not I'm not an extrovert and I've tried to be an extrovert a lot of my life because I thought that's how you should be and I'm finally mm. like it's okay not to socialize it's fine <laughs> or I mean other things of course but yeah and I probably a lot of people with lipedema can empathize with that trying to just change and be what everybody else is and yeah yeah I agree I think a lot of people in general even without lipedema yeah. can really um empathize with that I mean um, I have spent most of my life trying to be more polished just because of how I grew up and the environment that I grew up in. And then, um, you know, at work um, I see people come into the office and they are unapologetically themselves. Yeah. And, gosh, they shine. Yeah. They shine so brightly. And I think why am I wasting time trying to be polished when I can just be authentic and that's way more powerful? I think you guys are a great example of that. Like, obviously, you you in your head you might think yeah right but you do come across as genuine and authentic and I think that's what attracts people to you and I think since I've been more authentic and I'm a bit of a whinger I'm a bit of sarcastic I'm not an energetic person and I never have been and I think people relate to you more when you're just yourself and they can see that you're genuine and they I think we, we all can spot a fake <laughs> and yeah, I think it's just good for us to be ourselves. We need a mix of people. Yeah, we do. Absolutely. We're the only us in the world. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. And people will come to you for who you are. You yeah. know, you don't, you'll find your people, you'll resonate with someone and they're the people you want to have. Yeah, and it sounds like you guys have found your people to do the advocacy and stuff. And it's great, honestly, you you can tell that you have got a strong friendship and you've both got the same like focus and drive and that's what you need it's so Thank funny you. how we came across each other because like now ever since this podcast we talk every single day and if we don't talk every single day because maybe shell's out caravanning with her husband having a grand old time <laughs> it's so weird i sort of want to check it and be like is everything okay <laughs> why are we talking today oh that's great but, you know, the funny thing is we've only seen each other in person four times. Well, it shows that you don't like, need to have a physical we've friendship. We've got a virtual and, relationship. Yeah, and that <laughs> can be just as strong. <laughs> right. Yeah. I mean, thank God, for, um, thank God for our technology these days. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. But I will let you go anyway, because I know I've had you for about an hour and you'll be wanting to go to bed soon. <laughs> and I'm soon. just starting the day. So um, <laughs> thank you very much. I really appreciate your time. I'll pop all your information um, on screen and in the um, description and I'll let you know when the video is coming out. Um, thank you, Amy. Yeah. Thank you for thank what you, you do so as much. well. I mean, thank you for paving the way. Uh, like I, I, did you see my reel where I you came up on my favourites on my big TV? Yes, and I, was like, I know. I watch Amy's Amy's next um, <laughs> next. Yeah, that was amazing. YouTube. It was so great, and yeah. so like you you are creating a movement in your own right. And I think the more of us creating our own little communities, the better because we've got to get the word out. Yeah, and that's it. Yeah, when I saw that, I showed my husband because he helps me with the YouTube, and he's like, "Amazing, we're in Australia. Yeah, <laughs> we're not, are. but we are." <laughs> but yeah, no, it's great, and it's like we've got these uh, this like um, way of connecting with everybody in the world. So it's great that we're all taking advantage of it and using Absolutely. it for good. Yeah. yeah. But um, yeah. well, thanks again so much for your time. I really appreciate it. 
Thank you. Thank Amy. you for having us. No problem. All the best. And yes, you too. Have a great evening and I'll speak to you soon. Okay. okay. Bye. Bye. Bye.